Hey guys. Professor Tran, hey, how's it going? I, I got a question. Sure. So I'm almost done with my model. Mm -hmm. um, I'm comparing it to the other files you sent us, like the, all the pictures and everything on how the model is supposed to look like. Yeah. Mine somewhat looks like it. Does it have to be precise or? No. I mean, and, and there's no way I there's no way I could really check to see if it's really precise. I mean, I mean, okay. Anything that I can say, you know, it, it's going to be subjective, and that's that's not. 
um, you know, and that's that's not a fair way to grade someone on, on something like that. And and realize too that like, and and I realize too that you know all the all the models that I gave you guys, all the image data, like the people that created these had like weeks and weeks to work on these, and they were working on them like full time. And so I know you guys are doing this while taking you know lots of other classes and you know probably all the bunch of other crazy stuff that comes with being a student. And so I'm I'm not expecting that you guys you know um, match those things well. I'd, I'd be, I'd be amazed actually if, if you did match it really well. And so, you know, this, this project is, is kind of more just, just a, just a chance for you to kind of use research software and kind of get experience with that. And, and mostly just to use CFD and to do something that's kind of cool and unique that you haven't been able to do before. And so I'm, I'm not really checking these for accuracy. I'm, I'm more checking, you know, how much did you learn from this and how much did you're getting out of it? Yeah. Okay, sweet. All right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. What is it about sports that turns us into, or sports teams that turns us into cavemen? It's yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good, it's a, it's, yeah, I guess it's, I guess it's a very tribal thing. Like you root for your team that's kind of represent that you feel represents your city or your school or whatever like that. It's it's uh, yeah. I I, I can give them. I can give probably. I, I think it's an interesting question that I can discuss a lot more. But uh, if I if I'm gonna be if I can be 100 percent with you guys right now, it's it's. It's been a little bit of a rough week for me, so I'm I'm feeling it a little bit. So, but let's let's talk about this next week. That was weird. It, it kicked me out of a uh, Zoom and then kicked me, put me back in. Huh. Very strange. Have I considered getting more than one pet? Yeah, we've we've actually um, been kind of thinking about getting another kitten, um, but the uh, but our cat is so old right now that it's uh, we don't think that she would like it. And so we kind of want to let her live out her golden years, uh, and then we'll we'll probably get um, more than one cat after that. Okay, it's uh, five thirty, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, um, and so uh, so uh, good evening, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing? Yeah, she's she's grumpy all the time. <laughs> She's always hungry. How are you guys doing? Hopefully, hopefully better than grumpy. Although I know everyone's probably tired and stressed at this point. Good. How are you doing, Professor? Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, excited for the end of the week. Probably the most excited I've been for the end of the week because it's uh, been a little bit of a, of a rough week for me. But you know, um, I think everyone has rough weeks, and then you know, I think we all just got to hang in there and you know, get get through it. But 
you know, as, as, as busy as I am, you know, I, I know you guys always have it, uh, you know, 10 times worse than me. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe I've, I've told you guys before, but I think, you know, being a student, being a college student, I think just gets harder and harder and harder every year. And so, you know, it was, it didn't feel like it was that long ago for me when I was a student, but like seeing all the stuff that you guys have to put up with and all the classes you have to take and your workload and everything like that. It's, it's frankly, it's amazing. Like, I don't know if I would, I don't, I don't know if I would be able to keep up with, you know, all the stuff you guys do. So, um, and so, you know, hang in there for you guys too. And, you know, just know that you guys, you guys will always have my, my respect for, you know, everything you guys have to put up with. Um, okay. And so uh, today uh, we're going to finish up our, um, our lecture notes on, on oscillating flow in rigid vessels. Okay. And so uh, hopefully we finish the end of the, we get to the end of this lecture notes today, because this is kind of the last of the, what I call like the, the intense part of this class with like all the really intense math. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I know the last few weeks have been a little bit rough and I, and I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how, how I can actually assess you guys on these things. Cause because we do, we do still have a midterm coming up. So it's not for two weeks, but we do have a midterm coming up. And I think, you know, um, usually the way I like to do my midterms is I have a conceptual portion and a problem solving portion, but we haven't really done anything recently where, where I can ask you to problem solve on a test um, and, and, you know, and, 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 you know, expect you to, to finish something within that time limit. And so it might, I might do something that I've never done before. And I might do a, an exam with all conceptual questions. And so it'll just be all just short answer questions that, that, you know, that you would write down um, um, the answers to. And so, you know, I've, I've never done that before. And so this will probably be the first time, I think probably this is the best uh, opportunity to do it because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, to solve Bessel's equations or anything like that. So, um, and so, you know, um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking for the exam for two weeks from now. Uh, but we'll talk about it more next week as I kind of, I kind of, I kind of just thought about it right now and then, you know, um, you know, but we'll, as the idea kind of forms more in my head, then we'll, we'll talk about it more next week. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so announcements first. Um, and so uh, where there's, there's two things that are due tomorrow in this class. And so there's the geometry for your, for your final project and also homework four, uh, which is due uh, next week. Um, and so I, I've had a lot of conversations with you guys uh, throughout the week about your projects. Um, and I know some people have kind of switched their projects and stuff like that too. And so I want to give you guys one more week to do those um, do those things. I think um, you know it, it was it was kind of a lot more than I think a lot of us expected, and I think you know a lot of you guys I know are busy with with midterms and stuff like that. And so yeah, I want to give you guys another week just 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 so you feel like you don't have to rush through all that stuff because um, the geometry is 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 something that's really important. And so um, you know um, kind of kind of just to go off on something that was discussed before the class, like I'm. I'm not checking that your model is going to be exact. And so I'm not going to have the real, you know, the picture of the model and then your model. And I'm say, mm, you know, mm, I think, you know, could be a little bit better there. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I don't have a, I don't have time for that, but you know, what I, what I really want you guys to get from this project is, you know, I want you guys to be able to try something new, you know, try something that you probably never tried before in another class, work with some medical image data, work with the CFD code, work with research software. And so it's a lot of new things going on at the same time. And so, you know, for me to be, to me to like say that you have to get things like exactly right. That's, I think that's not really fair, especially given the, the time frame that you guys have had to work on it. And so, um, and so I, I don't want you guys to rush it and, and I, you know, and I don't want you guys to, uh, you know, to just stress about, you know, it has to be perfect. And so I want to give you guys one more week to, to complete that stuff, um, especially for, I know a lot of you guys kind of switched your models kind of, you know, uh, midway through this week too. And so, you know, hopefully the extra week will give you some more time to work on that, um, on that, on that project. Yeah, so I'm extending the due date for both the geometry and homework four um, um, because it's, I've, I've strangely not gotten any questions of homework four, which is, which is very uh, which is very strange to me, uh, given what homework four is. And so, you know, I want to make sure that you guys uh, take uh, I want to make sure you guys kind of take your time with that as well. And so, yeah, so both of those will be due uh, next Friday, uh, but I don't want to push it back any any more than that because it's because uh, um, you know I want you guys to, to you know get the models done and start working on the simulations as, as well. Yeah. So the uh, um, yeah, and so kind of what you know, and, and kind of going off what I've I've told um, you know um, you know other people too that um, or I, I kind of mentioned all that stuff at the beginning. I'm, my mind is elsewhere right now. I'm 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 pretty tired this week. Uh, okay. So uh, so are there any any questions on any of that before uh, um, you know before we get started for that and before we get started today? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, and so I'll, 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 put, I'll, push, I'll push back the, the due dates on Canvas um, after the lecture today. And so, you know, both of those things are going to be due um, next Friday. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and pick up uh, where we left off. Okay. And so the lecture notes we're going through right now is lecture notes 11. Um, and this is um, our lecture notes on oscillating flow in rigid vessels. All right, and so just to just to kind of refresh your memory, let's uh, let's let's uh, let's kind of um, put in context kind of what we're doing, right? And so in in these um, in this week, what we're concerned about is we want to look at how the velocity is distributed um, inside a vessel. Um, oh, I, I remember what I was going to say. So, so for the uh, and so for when you do turn in your project geometries, I, I I'm not looking for I'm not looking for the project file. I'm not looking for you know the VTP files or the project files itself. Just you just have to send me a screenshot for uh, for the model of, of what you have. Okay? And so kind of the pur the purpose of uh, of of uh, kind of the, the main reason I was doing this uh, this having the project geometry do at this point was to kind of just to make sure that you know you guys are working on it and you guys get credit for you know for starting it early. Because I've, I've I've seen situations where for this you know this project is is not that different from you know um, projects for uh, for classes that I I TA before back in grad school and you know the professor at the time didn't put a deadline on on, a, on didn't put like a checkpoint um, in the middle here and so what happened was um, you know a lot of people I'd say about half the class didn't try to start building their model until the night before and guess who had to deal with all of those uh, all of those students was the TA and so. It's not that's not an experience I want to uh, I want to I want to repeat, and so you know that's why I kind of have this checkpoint here. Um, and so if you have the one page progress report, that's that's great. And so if you did that already, that's 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 fine. And so that's that's going to help you write the final report. And so you don't have to redo it, um, anything like that. Just kind of take that information and then just uh, you know apply it towards your your final report. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And so uh, we're looking at a velocity distribution in a vessel, right? And so. Uh, we solved for this previously, and, and you've probably solved for this previously in your fluids class, because what we're interested in is, is say, you know, we have this kind of cylindrical vessel here, and we're interested in saying, you know, what does the velocity distribution look like as a function of radius? Right? And so we solved this from Nav so straight from Navier Stokes before. Um, and, um, you know, we saw that the flow was parabolic or the velocity distribution was parabolic, right? Okay. Um, and so that's fine. And so that's all that's good. You know, it's, it's, it's famous. It's named after someone. It's the hagen poiseuil flow, you know, all that is fine. But um, but we can't really, but you know, we can't really apply the solution to our blood flow um, um, in the human body because we know that you know because the heart is like pumping, 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 right? We don't, we don't really ever get steady flow inside the cardiovascular system, and so we know that our flow is oscillating, right? Or in other words, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, right? And so, kind of the whole point of this of this of this unit here is to extend, um, you know, what we know about velocity distributions from Navier-Stokes. And say, you know, let's look at it from the case where we have some time dependence. We have things that go up and down with time, and ask, how does this affect our solution? And so, in particular, we were looking at a situation that looked like uh, that looked like this, right? And so, we had a um, pressure gradient, right? 
And so our pressure gradient was a uh, partial P partial Z. Okay. And what we were saying is that this is equal to some um, sinusoidal function. Right? And so it's equal to A times E to the I omega T. Right? We remember um, I, E to the I omega T here, we can transform it into sines and cosines using Euler's formula. Right? And so this is the exact same thing as cosine omega T plus I sine And so this e to the i omega t, you know, we, we use this partially because it's, it's more convenient to write. Um, it's, it's easier to write e to the i omega t and then cosine, sine, you know, like, like some other stuff. Uh, but it allows us to kind of um, in, uh, encapsulate kind of both cosine and sine terms kind of together, right? Um, and so, you know, whenever you see an e to the i omega t, it's basically the same thing as like sines and cosines. And so it's, it's used very often for, um, you know, for these cases. All right. And so what we did last time was we, we kind of ran through kind of the bulk, um, the kind of the meat and the potatoes of the derivation. And we ended up with a solution that looked like this. Right. And we performed a lot of change of variables along the way. And so we had a solution of y of x is equal to c1 times j0 of x plus c2 y0 of x. Well, remember these j0 and these y0 here are the Bessel functions. Okay? And so this j0 here is the Bessel function of the first kind. And this y0 here is the, um, the less like child, or in other words, Bessel function of the second kind. Professor? Yep. Is that an I in front of the sign? Um, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And then I think right before we left on, on Tuesday, what we did is we applied these boundary conditions, uh, or we were in the middle of applying our boundary conditions. And we said that in order for us to get a finite solution, then we kick the we kick the, the younger child out of the family, and so we, we say that that term has to go to zero. Otherwise, it's impossible for us to, to get a, a finite solution. And so the next thing we have to do is we have to apply our second boundary condition, um, and then solve for c one. Okay, uh, so this is just kind of a recap from Tuesday. And so any any questions on on this so far? All right, and so the other boundary condition that we're going to apply here is uh, we have to um, um, specify a no slip boundary condition at the vessel wall. Okay. And so um, the no slip boundary condition basically says that u, uh, where u is our velocity, and if we apply this at little r is equal to big R, okay, uh, this has to be equal to zero. Okay? And so applying these same uh, conditions onto y, okay? Okay. we can say that y of, at r is equal to r is equal to u at r is equal to big R, which we know is zero. Okay, minus a over i omega rho. Okay. And so uh, we're going to take our function here and set it e set r little r equal to big R, and uh, set that whole thing equal to um, a over i omega rho. Okay. And so let's go ahead and and do that. And so if we plug in r is equal to, um, little r is equal to a big R here, then what we get is um, c1 j0 of um, big R i to the three halves square root of omega over nu, okay? And this is equal to minus a over i of omega rho 
And now that we have this um, algebraic expression right here, what we can do is we can use this to solve for C1. And so uh, we can go ahead and solve for that. We just have to divide both sides by the J0. And we say that C1 is equal to minus AI divided by rho omega J0 I to the 3 halves big R square root of omega over nu. And now that we have the C1 term, we can go ahead and plug it back in into our velocity solution and then uh, get our final, our final velocity. Okay. okay, so uh, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay, and so let's go ahead and plug that in. Okay. And so we get um, y of x, right? So we plug in um, C1 into this, we get um, minus AI divided by rho omega J0 of I to the 3 halves big R square root of omega over nu, okay? Times J0 I to the 3 halves little r square root of omega over nu, okay? Now that this is, uh, now that we have this for y, we can go ahead and solve for um, for u, right? Uh, because y, remember, was our change of variables. And so now let's solve for u. Okay, so remember u of r is equal to y of r plus um, a over i omega rho. And so we get u of r is equal to a over i rho omega times 1 minus j0 i to the 3 halves little r square root of omega over nu divided by j0 i to the 3 halves big r square root of omega over nu, okay, right? And so that's, um, that's our velocity distribution with respect to r, uh, but we're not done yet because, um, remember, this is, this is just the velocity distribution with respect to r. But we, want it, we want the velocity distribution with respect to r and time. So we want uz of r and t. Remember, this is u of r times e to the i omega t. And so this is kind of this is kind of where we started our derivation, kind of near the beginning of Tuesday. And so if you kind of look back on those notes, you you'll see this. Okay. And so we get our final solution for uz um, of r and t, okay. which is equal to a divided by i rho omega times one minus J zero I to the three halves little r square root of omega over nu divided by J zero I to the three halves big R square root of omega over nu okay, e to the I omega T. Okay. And so this here is our um, velocity distribution for the case when our pressure changed with time. Okay? And so it looks quite a bit different. And so if you compare this back to our Navier-Stokes solution, you know, our Navier-Stokes solution was kind of a very nice quantum quadratic function. This is something else. Okay? And so it's a, it, it, looks, it looks quite a bit scarier, uh, but, I'll, but, I'll, you know, but I'll, I'll plot it and I'll kind of show you kind of the general trends. Okay? And so for this, for this part, you know, again, um, you know, the mathematical details of all this are, are not, um, you know, to me, not, not super important for this class. Um, but I want you guys to be able to, um, you know, 
if I ask you, what does the velocity distribution look like, you know, then you'll be able to tell me um, under certain kinds of conditions. Right. And so we'll do that next. And so I'll draw some uh, and some um, some characteristic um, profiles. Um, and I actually have a MATLAB script that I um, that I can give you guys too, where you can where you can experiment with it um, as well. Um, okay. So any questions on any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so uh, let's plot let's plot the velocity profile and see what it looks like. Um, and let's plot this under several different frequencies. And so let's uh, let's do a, a relatively low frequency first. Okay. As remember, low frequency means that the the pressure waves are kind of going up and down, kind of gently like this, and it's it's not oscillating all too quickly. Okay. Um, and so if you um, if you if your frequency is pretty low, um, and so this would be the case for someone who has kind of a, a relatively slow heartbeat. So we're talking like Michael Phelps. Who has like an inhuman like 35 beats per minute or something like that, something absurd. Okay. And so if you have a, a low frequency, you know, you're you're actually gonna get um, velocity distributions that look pretty parabolic. And so you're going to get something that looks kind of like this. And so let's say that this is the velocity distribution at t is equal to zero. Okay. And so let's say that uh, you know even though even though it's oscillating slowly, it's still uh, it's still uh, changing with time. And so let's say that we uh, we plot the velocity distribution after some time has passed. And so after time passes, you know, the, the velocity distribution, it might look smaller because it's basically going back and forth, but it's still going to look parabolic. Okay. 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 And so that's uh, and so that's that's good. And so you know, for for low frequencies, um, the uh, um, we um, I call this the you'll and you'll see why later. This is called the the Wormersley distribution. Uh, the Wormersley distribution looks pretty parabolic. So in in the case where you have kind of low frequencies, you kind of approach the same behavior as if it was a steady solution, right? Uh, which intuitively makes sense, right? And so if you have a low frequency, then you're getting pretty close to steady steady conditions, right? And so the lower your frequency, the closer you are to steady. And so it makes sense that your velocity also behaves the same way as if it was steady. Okay. And so the interesting things start to happen when you start to get to high frequency, right? And so under high frequency, uh, what tends to happen is that, um, you know, because, the, because your fluid here has inertia, or because your blood has inertia, um, the blood can't respond fast enough to changes in the pressure. Right, and so if you increase the frequency, the pressure is going to be going like do 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 right, 
And so that's based, that's, you know, you kind of think of that as like kind of the heartbeat that, you know, maybe students have right before taking a, taking an exam, right? And so your heart's kind of beating like crazy. And so, you know, in those cases, you know, your blood, because it has a certain amount of inertia, you know, the pressure is going to want to push it just like this, like really fast. But the blood is like, oh, no, wait a minute, I can't, I can't respond that quickly. And so you kind of get some, some weirder looking, uh, some weirder looking velocity distributions that look like this. And so it's going to look maybe parabolic to start, but then because it's because the ones in the middle can't really respond, you might get something that looks like this. Okay, and so you have kind of a, a velocity distribution with kind of a divot in the middle. Okay, and then after some time passes, you know, it might look something like this, right? And so it might you know come up and it might just look kind of really flat like this. It's kind of a bad bad example. So it might look kind of like flat. Okay. All right, and you, you start to get these kind of interesting shapes that you that you um, haven't seen, uh, or you that we haven't seen before in the steady um, the steady case. Okay, and so uh, and so let me let me go ahead and switch to my laptop just so you can kind of see this in action. And I I, I haven't posted this yet. Because uh, I haven't had a chance to comment the script. It's it's a very short script, um, but it basically kind of illustrates these velocity distributions for you. So let me go ahead and switch to my laptop screen. Okay. All right. And so here's the here's the script for you. Okay. And so the main the main uh, quantities that I'm going to change here are going to be mostly the the frequency. Okay. And so um, this is the. Uh, um, um, you know, for right now, we're going to have a frequency of one, uh, and you can change the other parameters as well. So you can change the A parameter, the density, and the viscosity. Okay? Right? <clears throat> and if you look in, if you want to look into the code really quickly, you know, you'll you'll see that I have these functions here. It's called Bessel J, Bessel J, okay, Bessel J comma zero, Bessel J comma zero comma x, Bessel J zero comma x naught. Okay? And so this is kind of the MATLAB function that you would call to summon the Bessel function, right? Because remember what we talked about last time, that the Bessel function is, is kind of like one of those fundamental math functions that it's, um, it's kind of like sine and cosine or tangent, right? Like where you know, like those are kind of built into our, our mathematical like calculators and computers, but it's hard, but it's not like you can express them any other way, okay? And so even though, you know, the Bessel functions, I know probably for a lot of you, it's your first time seeing those, um, you can just call them in MATLAB just like this, and it's, it's really easy. All right, so I'm going to start with the case where the frequency is really low. And so let me start with a frequency of one. And so this is like Michael Phelps, right? And so Michael Phelps basically has velocity distributions that look very nice and parabolic, right? And so they look um, pretty nice. Okay, so let's increase this frequency a little bit. And let's see how the velocity changes as we increase the frequency. Right? And so let's increase it by a factor of five. And so let's go up to um, frequency of five. And we'll run the code, and you can see here that you know um, we're starting to have some flow reversal here, right? And so you can see that the velocity is going forward one way, uh, and because the velocity is fast enough that you know we're pulling kind of backwards like this. Okay? And so you know it's it's hard to see from the still image like this, but <clears throat> but basically the velocity is uh, going kind of back and forth like this, right? You can imagine it's kind of like kind of going back and forth, um, and and during some uh, middle stages here, you can see that we've kind of broken away from the parabolic pattern. If you look at this green one in the middle, it's kind of transitioning in between kind of going from the left and going from the right, right? And so we have some part of it, you know, on the edges that wants to go left, but then some parts in the middle that want to go right. All right, so let's increase this a little bit more. And so let's increase the frequency to 15. And you can see here that we're, we're getting some more kind of really interesting shapes. And so you can see now we're getting these kind of divot things, right? Where now the, now the pressure is oscillating so fast that the fluid can't really keep up. And so you, that's why you have these kind of really weird looking distributions. Okay? Um, at some times you do get a parabolic distribution as you can see in the purple um, and then this far red one right here, you can see they're parabolic. But in most other times you get kind of these weird kind of you know, looking um, distributions right here just because the pressure's oscillating so fast that the, that the fluid just can't keep up. Okay? And just for fun, let's go ahead and crank this up all the way to 50, okay? And you can see here that we've kind of, you know, exacerbated these more and more. And so now that we're oscillating so fast, you know, we don't get any parabolic flow. And so right when the flow is about to be parabolic, then the pressure distribution is like, 
turn around, go the other way, right? Um, and so, you know, the faster you, you oscillate it, you know, the more you get these kind of weirder, uh, weirder oscillations here, okay? Um, and the best, and the, uh, the velocity solution with the Bessel functions kind of captures these things, uh, you know, really, really well. Uh, okay, so any, any questions on, you know, what these um, velocity distributions look like? What are the appropriate axes names for this? Ah, good question. And so the uh, the the y-axis here is the is the radius. And so I basically normalize it's just that the uh, the a y a y value of zero here that's the middle of the vessel, and then uh, y values of one and negative one those are the edges of the vessel. Um, and then the x-axis here that gives you the the magnitude of the velocity. And so right. right. Okay. Got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. I'll, I'll, I'll enable that before I post this script. All right. Okay, so let me go back. We'll go back to our notes again. Okay, and so now, uh, now we've seen the, the Walmersley distribution um, and how um, you know, the velocity changes with time. And so, actually, you know, for those of you who have who have, who have gone to the simulation part of some vascular, uh, when you're when you're supplying your inlet boundary conditions, um, you probably you probably you might have noticed that one of the options for the velocity profile was uh, Walmersley, um, and then um, and this is kind of exactly what it would look like. Um, so, but for most cases, you know, there's not that much difference between parabolic and Walmersley, but you know, for some cases that it does, and so so vascular gives you that option, but um, most of the time it doesn't make too big a, too big of a difference. Okay. All right. And so up to this point, you know, we've solved for the Walmersley solution, but we've only solved it for a single frequency, right? And so if you kind of look back into our um, our result here, you know, we only have just a single frequency, you know, in these uh, in these problems. Okay. And so we only have one omega. Okay? And so you saw that in the script too. That you know, every time I wanted to change the frequency, um, you know, I had to kind of manually change it and run the code again. Um, Another thing that you know we should notice here is that um, you know um, because we're limited to just e to the i omega t, what this is is this is just a cosine or sine term at a single frequency. And so right now our solution is limited to this. And so if we could if we could plot, um, you know, cosine and sine. Let's so let me do cosine first, and then we'll do sine. Right. Okay. Uh, right now this is what our pressure our pressure distribution looks like. This basically. Um, but, you know, in, in reality, the pressure waveform doesn't look like this um, at all, right? And so you kind of, if we kind of think back to our unit on arterial biomechanics, right, our pressure waveform looks something more like this. And it repeats, of course. Okay. Right. And so that's our real pressure, um, you know, pressure um, waveform. Um, and remember, so the the idea with this whole thing is that we want to be able to uh, realistically simulate um, these uh, these kinds of uh, pressure waveforms. But right now, you know, we're not even, you know, we're we're kind of close, but but not super close, right? And so, you know, if if the bottom is what we want to actually simulate. You know, if we're just limiting ourselves to just a, a cosine and sine of a single frequency, you know, we're, we're still quite a bit off. And so, you know, um, 
even though you know we, we, we can produce all these nice looking glossy distributions, because they're limited to just a single frequency, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine that these would actually um, behave exactly as it would in, in real life. And so we need to kind of, we, can, we need to kind of draw, we, we need to make the bridge here. And so we need to make a connection for how can we take the solution that we have right now, which we've worked really hard for, and how do we apply that to kind of general, a general case like this? Okay. All right. Um, and actually, you know, the, the connection here is, is um, you know, hopefully, hopefully someone, hopefully something that is an old friend of yours, um, if not an old friend, maybe an old enemy, but hopefully it's an old something, okay? Uh, and so the connection that we're going to make in between these two guys is going to be our Fourier series. And so think back to your your three-way class, and you know, um, and and some of you I had in my three-way class, and so I know for sure we went over this, and so you know you can't you can't BS me. I know we went over this, okay? Um, and so you know the Fourier series stuff that we learned back then, or whoever you have to three-way, um, you know, we're gonna bring that back here, okay? Uh, and so it's gonna be a little bit of bash, a blast from the past, and so I'll I'll review kind of the important stuff here, um, but what you'll see is that this is kind of the 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 really the one of the perfect applications for Fourier series for, for this because with Fourier series we can we can basically model any waveform that we that we want. Okay. Um, okay and so any questions on this before we uh, uh, we, we start to review Fourier series? Okay. Oh questions sorry. Oh, sorry, Manuel. So let's see. So the max velocity in high frequencies are less than in low frequencies. Yes, yes, because uh, um, because in high frequencies, you know, you never really develop that high frequency or that high velocity because right because like you know before you can develop into that nice parabolic max um, frequency, then the pressure gradient is going to pull you back and go the other way, and so you're going to go this, 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 and it's going to be like con continuously pulling you about um, before you kind of before you can reach that that max. Yeah. Okay. And so let's review uh, Fourier series. Okay. And so Fourier series, um, you know, just, just to kind of put it in a nutshell, what Fourier series allows us to do is it allows us to represent any periodic function, no matter what it looks like, and then represent it as an infinite summation of sinusoids. And I really mean any. And so no matter what your function looks like, as long as it's periodic, we can represent it as a Fourier series, right? And so um, if you look at our, our pressure waveform, okay? Our pressure waveform look like this, okay? And so it's, a, it's kind of a weird, weird ass kind of funky looking dude, okay? Um, you know, it doesn't really fit to any kind of uh, uh, a mathematical function. Um, but, you know, what we see here is that it's periodic. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, what a per all a periodic function means is that it, it kind of, it repeats itself after a set amount of time.
uh, professor? Yeah. What does that word say? As an infinite sum? Oh, su uh, summation. Oh, summation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And so since this uh, function repeats itself, and so you can see here that once we kind of pass this point, then the, you know, if, if my art was a little bit better, then you'd be able to see it better. Okay? And so since this is a periodic function, it, it satisfies the criteria for um, a Fourier series representation. And so what we can say is that, you know, before what we said was um, partial P partial Z was equal to A E to the I omega T and so we, we ran through our whole derivation with, uh, with this in mind. What we can say is that if, if our pressure gradient here was some kind of generic uh, function on the left, what we can do, <clears throat> and it's kind of convenient that we have it in this form, all we have to do is add this summation out in front. Okay. Add this N, add this N right here, okay? And then now our pressure gradient is a, um, you know, is this infinite summation instead, uh, instead of a or just a single sinusoid term. Okay. okay. And uh, and now these a's here, so these a n's, and so if you remember from Fourier series, these are the coefficients of the um, um, of the Fourier series. Um, these are really important because these have to be selected or these have to be optimized such that we match the um, the target periodic function. Okay. We won't go through that that procedure because um, normally because that's that's normally uh, that's a three that's kind of a three away thing and and you know not kind of the uh, the subject of this class but just know that you know uh, when you have a Fourier series selecting those coefficients is kind of the key thing okay? uh, but thankfully you know there's act there's actually a lot of computer programs that'll do that for you and MATLAB is one of them okay all right and so now that our solution here is an infinite summation of these um, of these sinusoid terms. We can then modify our velocity um, um, solution uh, to kind of account for this, okay? and it's actually a very small modification. And so, you know, um, this this whole proof and this whole um, thing with the Bessel functions and everything was chosen uh, very carefully, such that it it can uh, it can um, um, generalize it this um, you know pretty well. Okay, so any any questions on on this? And so now let's write down the generalized um, Walmersley velocity profile. Okay. And so it looks very similar to what we had before. Um, the only difference is that we're going to add a summation to it. Okay. And so du z of r and t is equal to summation. And I'm going to cut off the summation. And so I'm not going to have it be infinity. Uh, but instead, I'm going to cut it off at some, um, some um, finite value big N. Okay. And so this looks uh, this looks very similar. Okay. Right. <clears throat> All right. Um, 
And so this, and this is actually really convenient too, because because we because we know how to solve for this uh, velocity distribution, <coughs> for the case of a single frequency. And so when we when we want to add together, uh, or when we want to do this for a general profile, all we have to do is just solve this for multiple frequencies and just add them all together. Okay, which in MATLAB is a very very simple process. Okay. And so this is nice. And so, um, you know, we can, because, you know, we, we derived our solution in terms of these, um, you know, Euler's formula, you know, generic sinusoids, it generalizes to these general forms, you know, really, really well, okay? All right. And so let me make just a quick comment about this big N right here, okay? And so this big N, okay? This is usually um, called the, uh, the number of Fourier modes or the, or the cutoff mode. Because that's that's something that you as the as the user can determine. Okay, and so you can you can determine how many terms you want in your Fourier series expansion. And so the general rule for this is that the more the higher this number is, or the more modes that you include, um, the more um, the more accurate your representation is going to be. Um, but, you know, the more accurate your representation is, um, the more likely you are to have like a lot of jaggedy um, sh or sharp, sharp changes in your, um, in your representation. Okay. And so the less modes that you do, the less modes that you have in your Fourier series expansion Basically means that you know you're you're going to get a less accurate uh, less accurate representation. Okay, um, but um, you know when you uh, um, uh, when you have less modes, then your then your your curve is going to be a lot smoother. Okay, which is sometimes what you want. So sometimes you actually you you're okay with actually sacrificing a little bit of accuracy as long as your waveform looks 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 smooth, okay? Because that's going to lead to kind of a very nice kind of well-behaved um, solution. Okay. And so generally, you know, um, you know, there's there's of course, you know, this is this is a setting that you can change um, for your simulations. But generally, the uh, the the number of modes that that works kind of practically well for everything is uh, ten, at least for cardiovascular simulations. And so if you have 10 modes, then, um, then you're, usually, you're usually pretty good. Okay, okay. Uh, so any questions, on, uh, any questions on this? Okay, all right. So that's, uh, you know, that's how you can modify our Walmersley um, solution here for any kind of general waveform. And so all you have to do is kind of use um, the Fourier, um, you know, the Fourier series for that. Okay? And probably homework five, you know, I'll, I'll have you guys kind of practice with this a little bit. Um, and if you've never used kind of the Fourier transform within MATLAB, which is the uh, FFT function, um, then you'll you'll get a chance to do that, that there. Okay. Uh, but FFT is kind of the function in MATLAB that's used to determine the um, um, the Fourier series coefficients. Okay. And so if you never used it before, I think this is a good chance to learn because it's, uh, it's, it's one of the really nice features of MATLAB is to be able to do Fourier series. Because that's use, this is useful because that's useful for you know, things way beyond um, you know, um, this class. OK. All right, and so let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about the Walmersby number a little bit. Okay? Or for, let's, let's actually define what it is.
Okay. And so if we if we look back at our velocity distribution here, we can see that um, one of the key quantities that it relies on is kind of this. We'll ignore we'll ignore i because it's it's imaginary anyway, and so it it's, it can't hurt us. And so let's focus on that quantity um, r times square root frequency divided by viscosity. And so that was kind of a key quantity within our within our vessel function. Okay. And so what we can do is, is uh, since this, you know, if you work out the units for this, this is actually non-dimensional. Okay. Because R here has uh, units of meters. Okay. Omega here has units of one over seconds, and then nu. Our viscosity has uh, units of mu squared over seconds. Okay. Angel, shut up. And then, uh, and so if we work out the units for this, we have omega over nu. And then this is one over seconds divided by meter square over seconds. Okay. And so this is, um, let's see, seconds squared. Oh, sorry, the seconds cancel out. And so we have, um, let's see, one over meter squared. And we take the square root. This becomes one over meters. And then we have radius times this. And so the meters from the radius cancel out with that. Okay. And so this expression here is, uh, is totally, it's totally non-dimensional. Okay. okay. And so, um, and so, you know, whenever any whenever we have kind of a non-dimensional quantity like this, and any time it kind of naturally comes out from our from our expressions, we can define this as kind of a new non-dimensional number. Okay, and so that's exactly what we're going to do. And so this alpha quantity right here is known as our Wormsley number. Um, and in fact, actually, you know, we usually, you know, because the square root is kind of ugly, you know, no one really likes to look at a square root. And so we usually um, um, express it in terms of, uh, we usually square it just to kind of get rid of it. And so usually we have alpha squared, which is equal to omega over nu <coughs> times some uh, characteristic length squared. And so up there, our characteristic length is the radius, which is which as it usually is for a, you know for a um, for a cylindrical vessel. Uh, but really, you can apply the Wormsley number to any kind of situation. So this L, this L right here is just any kind of characteristic length. Okay. All right. Yes, yeah, it kind of it kind of is like the it kind of is like that uh, natural frequency, okay? and just like any kind of uh, you know non-dimensional number, like kind of if you think of some of the other famous ones like the Reynolds number, you think of things like the in heat transfer, you have like the Neusel number, you have the Viot number, you have the Prankel number, right? Um, all these named after named after a dude, right? Because that's because uh, scientists are, are very egotistical, um, but just like all of those other non-dimensional numbers. You know these represent some kind of um, of ratio, okay. And for the Wormsley number, the ratio is the following. And so we have a ratio of uh, what's called transient inertial effects. Okay. And so that's represented by our frequency omega, right? And then on the denominator here, we have nu, and so the bottom is going to be viscous effects. Okay. And so that's what our Wormsley number, um, Wormsley's number represents. Okay. And so depending on the Wormsley number, um, then you're going to get different behaviors for, um, you know, for the velocity profile. And so we've kind of already seen it. And so, you know, we plotted the velocity profile as a function of, you know, different values of the frequency. 
But if we frame that in terms of the Walmersley number, then, you know, it kind of gives it a little bit more context. And so I'm going to kind of repeat, um, you know, uh, what we said earlier about the different velocity distributions. Um, but now I'm going to do it in terms of the Walmersley number. Um, okay, so any questions on any questions on this? Not you, Angel. Okay. All right. And so let's let's go ahead and look at our velocity results again um, in terms of the Walmers number. Okay. All right. And so let's let's first look at the case where Walmers number is about about one. And so when Walmersley's number is about one, you know, what this tells us is that the ratio of um, transient inertial effects and viscous effects is about equal, okay? And in these cases, you know, because um, because the viscous um, effects are about the same magnitude as the oscillation, this gives the flow enough time to catch up to the oscillations. And so when the flow can kind of easily catch up to these, then you end up with um, kind of the profile that it naturally wants to um, obtain, which is the parabolic profile. Okay. All right, and so if we plot out the velocity distributions at several different um, points in time, you know, what you'll see is um, basically different parabolas with different, uh, you know, different sizes. Okay. And so you might see big parabolas, you might see small parabolas, but they're all going to be parabolas. Okay. Um, because this is, you know, remember the, the parabola is kind of the shape that the flow naturally wants to assume because, um, you know, that's, that's, kind of, that's just kind of what's most natural for it. And so when the viscous forces are on the same order of magnitude as the oscillation, um, then it can do this very, very easily. All right, and so, you know, the flow might reverse, you know, because of the, you know, because of the pressure gradient, um, but it's, 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 it's reducing at a speed that's, that's slow enough that the velocity can, um, the fluid can kind of catch up. Okay, uh, so any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so uh, when Walmersley is about equal to one, then you get kind of um, situations that um, they look like this, okay? Um, okay, and so now let's look at a situation when the Walmersley number is um, pretty high. In particular, let's look at uh, what happens when the Walmersley number is greater than 10. Okay? Right, and so in these cases, the um, oscillatory inertia forces start to dominate um, and the viscous boundary layer doesn't have enough time to propagate. Okay. And so this is when the velocity distribution starts to have those kind of weird kind of what I call like kind of plug like um, behavior. Okay. So 
if we can draw just kind of a few different examples. So, and so kind of in the most extreme case, you might have velocity distributions with kind of a, a divot like that. Okay. You might have some that look kind of flat, maybe like that. Maybe some that look a little bit kind of a bulging, just like that. Okay. And of course, you have kind of the opposite um, direction as well. Okay. Right. And so these are kind of these are the cases when you know the frequency goes starts to go really really high. Okay. Right. And, I, and and just like uh, Manuel was uh, mentioning earlier, that you know in these kind of situations, the centerline velocity can never achieve its its maximum value. And so, you know, one way that you can you can get high Walmersley number is, is of course you can raise the frequency. Okay, but if you look at kind of the other uh, the other quantities that go into the Walmersley number, you can see that you know viscosity is in the denominator here. Okay, and so another way that you can get a high Walmersley number is just to you know reduce the viscosity. Okay, and you know, and that's that's easier said than done. And so it's not viscosity is not usually a dial that you can turn, uh, but you know it kind of gives you an idea of you know, what happens if we replace blood with a with a fluid that's a lot less viscous, right? So maybe like air or something like that, okay? Um, or, you know, the opposite is true too, where like you might have a situation with really high frequency, but, you know, if you had a, if you had a fluid with a very high viscosity, like honey or molasses or something, then that high viscosity will be able to kind of cancel out those high, um, those high oscillations, okay? And so it's always, remember, it's, it's always the ratio that's kind of important. And so, you know, just because you have a high frequency of flow doesn't mean that you're going to get these, these um, you know, these, these kind of weird looking velocity profiles. It's always going to be the ratio between the oscillation effects and the viscous effects. Okay. All right. And so, uh, so any questions on, um, on this? Okay. And so, you know, the reason I, I brought up this this Wormersley number is that it's it's often it's often used a lot um, when characterized the flow um, in the human body. Okay, and so a lot of times you might read like a scientific paper or scientific report, right? And they might report things like the Wormersley parameter or the Wormersley number. Right? And a lot of times, you know, when you first read that, you're like, you know, what the hell does that mean? Uh, but now, but now you kind of know. Right? And so let's go over some kind of uh, some typical Wormersley numbers um, that you'll see in different parts of the body. All right, and so the first the first one that we'll go over here is for um, the larger vessels. Okay. And so these will be vessels like your aorta, right? Like your uh, main pulmonary trunk. Okay, vessels that you know. Um, Mostly, a lot of the vessels that you guys are dealing with in your projects too, because it's if you can see it in the image data and it shows up pretty well, then it's it's usually probably a, a you know a pretty big vessel. Okay. And so Wormersley numbers for uh, for these ones usually are in the range of about thirteen to fifteen. Okay. Right. And so they're pretty high, mostly due to their kind of large size. Okay. Uh, and so because their radii are pretty big, then you end up with, you know, some pretty big Wormersley numbers for, for these guys, okay? And so that tells you that, you know, for these large, um, for these large vessels, you know, you don't, you don't often achieve, um, you know, parabolic velocity profiles in these vessels just because, you know, before the, before the, um, the profile can achieve parabolic conditions, you know, the, the uh, pressure is going to bring it back and go back the other way. And so if you look at smaller vessels, things like maybe um, arterioles or, or capillaries. Okay. Okay. 
these have a Wormsley number of about around 0 0.04. And so these are a lot lower. And so, you know, in the smaller vessels, this basically tells us that, you know, we, we usually don't really have a problem achieving um, nice parabolic velocity profiles in the, uh, in the smaller vessels, okay? Okay, and so one way that you can kind of think of this is that, you know, because the larger vessels here are much bigger, um, you know, they're gonna have a lot more inertia too, because there's just, just a lot more fluid, you know, inside those vessels than the smaller ones. And so it's gonna take a lot more time and a lot more force to get those, those flows moving uh, compared to the smaller vessels, which don't have that much, uh, which don't have that much inertia. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and so these are kind of the 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 the, uh, the parameters that you might see. Okay? And if you if you're reading kind of you know scientific reports or uh, or anything like that, and you see you know Wormersley parameter or Wormersley number, Wormersley anything, you know you know you kind of know now what they what they represent. Okay. So any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay, so I, do, I want to go over one more thing um, in this unit before we sign off for the week, and this and that's the concept of uh, calculating wall shear stress. Okay, and so it's, it's been a while since we've seen wall shear stress, right? Like we've. Uh, We've kind of we've kind of talked about it before as something that's really important for uh, for mechanical transduction and for uh, vessel uh, remodeling. Okay, but we haven't really talked about how we actually compute it, just because you know for all the methods that we've gone over so far, things like mock parameter models, things like one D equations, right? We haven't we just it's just not possible. Um, but you know now that we have these kind of two D distributions of velocity, we can actually start to compute uh, wall shear stress, right? And that's this is kind of a first. And so just to kind of remind you, the way that we compute wall shear stress, which we give it the symbol tau w, okay? Okay, so this is our wall shear stress, WSS, this is equal to mu times partial ur, partial r, and we evaluate this expression at r is equal to big R. Sorry, this is a partial uz. Okay? So we want the, uh, the z component of the velocity. And then we just have to take the derivative of that with respect to with respect to r, okay, right? And uh, and we can do this now because now we have an expression for u z of um, of r. All right, and so we need to do, we need to know kind of one thing before we actually go about and do this, um, and that's how to actually take the derivative of the Bessel function. Okay. Um, and thankfully it's, it's, it's pretty simple. And so if you have, you know, your, your Bessel function of the first kind, J zero of X, if we take the derivative of this, okay, the way that we take the, the derivative of this is minus j1 of x, okay? And so you can see we still have a, a, a Bessel function here, okay? And so this is a Bessel function of the first kind. Um, but instead of uh, instead of being order zero, which is you know what we have on the left, instead of being j zero, what we have is j one, and this is a Bessel function of the first kind of the first order. Okay. And don't worry about it. This is something that you can plug into MATLAB as well, right? And so when you're plugging in um, Bessel functions in MATLAB. You just have to say that, you know, I want an order one vessel function, okay? All right, 
And so all we, that we need to do to compute the, uh, the wall shear stress is to just take the derivative um, of our velocity distribution with respect to r, okay? And so I'm gonna do that on the next page and I'm gonna do it in terms of the general, um, the general velocity distribution, you know, with all the Fourier series stuff, okay? And so this is kind of, you know, putting everything together, you know, to compute wall shear stress, you know, which is something that we just, we, we just haven't had a way to compute that before. Okay, so any questions on, uh, any questions on this before we, uh, we compute that? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. So what, so I've seen you use uh, same thing or why, why do you use it like interchangeably? Like what's the difference? Are we, uh, what are you talking about? Because uh, you have, right, mu is viscosity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you use like the, the capital V, but sideways, isn't that ah. viscosity as well? Ah, yeah, that's a good, uh, good, good question. So, um, and so this mu right here, this one is dynamic viscosity. Uh -huh. And so the new that I've used before, this is kinematic viscosity. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I always forget to, uh, to make that distinction. And so the way that they're related is that they're related through the density. And so the, um, the formula is if you take your kinematic viscosity and you multiply it by the density, this gives you your dynamic viscosity. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they both represent viscosity. It's just uh, they're, they're kind of just different forms of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and so let's go ahead and compute the uh, um, the derivative of our velocity distribution with respect to R. Okay. All right, and so what we want to compute is partial u z, partial r. Okay, and so this is equal to partial partial r of um, this whole thing, and so summation n is equal to zero to n of a n or I rho omega times one minus J zero I to three halves little r square root of omega of o mu divided by J zero I to three halves big R square root of omega over nu, okay? Um, e to the I omega T or I, I omega n t, okay. Close bracket, okay. And then we're going to take the derivative of this with respect to r, okay. And luckily, you know, we only have one term here that's uh, that's that has a little r, and that's this term right here, okay. And so, um, you know, in terms of the derivative here, everything else is going to be a constant. And so, you know, when we take actually take the derivative, we end up with the following. And so we end up with summation little n is equal to zero up to big N of a n over i omega, uh, i rho omega, omega n, sorry, all these omega should be omega n's okay. um, times. Uh, this one term here is going to go away because it's just a, it's just a constant. Okay. And so we're not going to worry about that. And then we're going to take the derivative of this J zero term on the numerator here, which we're going to use the formula on the previous page along with our chain rule. Okay. And so by the chain rule, we have to have an I to three halves and the square root of omega N over nu come out. Okay. okay. And so this comes out due to chain rule. And this is multiplied by, uh, we have this negative out in front, uh, but that negative is gonna be canceled out by the negative from the derivative, okay? And so we end up with J1, I to three halves, little r, square root of omega of nu. Okay? Now we have J1 because we took the derivative. times e to the i omega n t, okay? 
right? And so that's our derivative. And so all we have to do now is multiply that by the viscosity, um, and then we get um, our wall shear stress. And I know I'm out of time, but I just have one more line to write. So let me, let me just do that real quick. And so in the end, what we get is tau w is equal to summation n is equal to one, zero to big N of mu a n divided by i rho omega n okay, times i to the three halves square root of omega over nu okay, times j1 i to the three halves big R um, square root of omega over nu okay, divided by j0, i to the 3 halves, big R, square root of omega over nu, okay, times e to the i omega t. Okay. And that is our wall shear stress as a function of time um, in our um, Wormersley vessel. Okay. All right, any final questions on this before we, uh, we wrap up for the week? Okay, All right. So thank you guys for uh, for sitting through this. I, I know it was a lot of math, uh, but after this, you know, we're uh, this is kind of it for the kind of the intense math stuff. And so next week, my plan is to talk about um, the veins a little bit, and we'll talk about the microcirculation. And so you know, those are topics that you know we've kind of avoided up to this point. Uh, but I think you know, in order to get a full picture of uh, of the cardiovascular system, I think it'd be good to talk about. Okay. All right. So have a great weekend, everyone. Remember the deadline for the model and for homework four is going to be extended a week, and so you have another week for that. Um, and so, uh, and so have a great weekend, everyone, and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Professor Tran. I'm going. All right. Thanks. You too. Free angel. <laughs> uh, get... a question. Oh yeah. Yeah. What's up? Um, for, uh, when we turn in our geometry, do you also want the, uh, like a, like a, like a PDF of like the one page summary? Uh, if you, if, uh, Word doc? It's not required, but it's uh, but if you want to write it, I think it'd be helpful for your final report. And so, uh, you know, any any writing that you can do right now, um, based on you know what you know from the model, uh, you know that's that's something you can do in the final report. But then for for this, I'm just going to be looking at screenshots for your uh, for your model. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Professor. Okay. Yeah. What's up? So I just wanted to say thank you for uh, that. I remember us discussing about me getting my computer so I can actually get the software yeah. uh, up and running. So um, just, uh, you know, appreciate it. So I have a little bit more time to be able to get my, my things together. Yeah, I, I, that's the general sense that I got, you know, not, I mean, kind of from everyone in the class. And I think a little more time I think would be helpful because uh, I, I don't want you guys to rush through the models because, you know, the models are, it's, it's gonna, you know, you rush through the models and it's gonna create more problems for the CFD down the road. And so, you know, I said, you know, let me give you guys one more week, um, you know, get some good models out and then, you know, the CFDs are gonna be much nicer from, from there. Definitely, definitely. So I highly appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend. Thanks, you too. Uh, Professor, just one more thing. Yeah. Uh, for my model, I, I felt that when I was doing the segmentations, it would come out a little bit ugly, the model. Mm -hmm. So I actually made the circles a little bit more like, like I'd say perfect or more circular. Yeah. So the model looks actually, well, it looks nice. I mean, it doesn't look too, uh, too deformed, but I don't know if that might, that may take away from uh, the realisticness of the artery or if I should go back and make it, make the segmentations as they were. Yeah, that's, uh, that's that's always the question because it's uh, you know the, the more the more the more you the more exact you kind of make it to the to the image data, especially when the image data is a little bit grainy, like kind of like how it tends to be, then it's mm -hmm. uh, you it makes it a lot more jaggedy. And so um, if you have screenshots of both, you can send it to me, and then I can I can kind of give you more uh, more direct feedback on on that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll email you so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, that sounds that sounds good. Okay, thank you. Yeah.